1934. Hope in a drizzle. Quarter inch of rain is nothing to complain about. It'll help the plants above ground and start the new seeds growing. That quarter inch of rain did wonders for Ma, too, who is ripe as a melon these days. She has nothing to say to anyone anymore, except how she aches for rain at breakfast, at dinner, all day, all night. She aches for rain. Today, she stood out in the drizzle, hidden from the road and from Daddy, and she thought from me, but I could see her from the barn. She was bare as a pear, raindrops sliding down her skin, leaving traces of mud on her face and her long back, trickling dark and light paths, slow tracks of wet dust down the bulge of her belly. My dazzling ma, round and ripe and striped like a melon. July 1934. Dion Quintuplets. While the dust blew down our road, against our house, across our fields, up in Canada, a lady named Elisir Dion gave birth to five baby girls all at once. I looked at Ma, so pregnant with one baby. Can you imagine five? I said. Ma lowers herself into a chair, tears dropping on her tight, stretched belly. She wept just to think of it. July 1934. Wild Boy of the Road A boy came by the house today. He asked for food. He couldn't pay anything, but Ma set him down and gave him biscuits and milk. He offered to work for his meal. Ma sent him out to see Daddy. The boy and Daddy came back late in the afternoon. The boy walked two steps behind in Daddy's dust. He wasn't more than 16. Thin as a fence rail. I wondered what Livy Killian's brother looked like now. I wondered about Livy herself. Daddy asked if the boy wanted a bath, a haircut, a change of clothes before he moved on. The boy nodded. I never heard him say more than yes sir, or no sir, or much obliged. We watched him walk away down the road in a pair of Daddy's mended overalls, his legs like willow limbs his arms like reeds. Ma rested her hands on her heavy stomach. Daddy rested his chin on the top of my head. His mother is worrying about him, Ma said. His mother is wishing her baby would come home. Lots of mothers wishing that these days. While their sons walk to California, where rain comes, and the color green doesn't seem like such a miracle, and hope rises daily, like sap in a stem. And I think, someday, I'm going to walk there too, through New Mexico and Arizona and Nevada. Someday, I'll leave behind the wind and the dust and walk my way west and make myself to home in that distant place of green vines and promise. July 1934. The Accident I got burned bad. Daddy put a pail of kerosene next to the stove and Ma, fixing breakfast, thinking the pail was filled with water, lifted it to make Daddy's coffee, poured it. But instead of making coffee, Ma made a rope of fire. It rose up from the, from the stove to the pail and the kerosene burst into flames. Ma ran across the kitchen, out the porch door, screaming for Daddy. I tore after her, then, thinking of the burning pail left behind in the bone-dry kitchen. I ran back and grabbed it, throwing it out the door. I didn't know. I didn't know Ma was coming back. The flaming oil splashed onto her apron, and Ma, suddenly Ma, was a column of fire. I pushed her to the ground, desperate to save her, desperate to save the baby. I tried beating out the flames with my hands. I did the best I could, but it was no good. Ma got burned bad. July 1934. Burns. At first, I felt no pain, only heat. I thought I might be swallowed by the heat, 
like the witch in Hansel and Gretel, and nothing would be left of me. Someone brought Doc Rice. He tended Ma first, then came me. The doctor cut away the skin on my hands. It hung in crested strips. He cut, away my, he cut my skin away with scissors, then poked my hands with pins to see what I could feel. He bathed my, hand, my burns in antiseptic. Only then the pain came. July, 1934. Nightmare. I am awake now, still shaking from my dream. I was coming home through a howling dust storm. My lower face was scrubbed raw by dirt and wind. Grit scratched my eyes. It crunched between my teeth. Sand chafed inside my clothes, against my skin. Dust crept inside my ears, up my nose, down my throat. I shuddered, nasty with dust. In the house, dust blew through the cracks in the walls. It covered the floorboards and heaped against the doors. It floated in the air, everywhere. I didn't care about anyone, anything, only the piano. I searched for it, found it under a mound of dust. I was angry at Ma for letting in the dust. I cleaned off the keys, but when I played, a tortured sound came from the piano, like someone shrieking. I hit the keys with my fist, and the piano broke into a hundred pieces. Daddy called to me. He asked me to bring water. Ma was thirsty. I brought up a pail of fire and Ma drank it. She had given birth to a baby of flames. The baby burned at her side. I ran away to the Eaton's farm. The house had been tractored out, tipped off its foundation. No one could live there. Everywhere I looked were dunes of rippled dust. The wind roared like fire. The door to the house hung open, and there was dust inside, several feet deep, and there was a piano. The bench was gone, right through the floor. The piano leaned toward me. I stood and played. The relief I felt to hear the sound of music after the sound of the piano at home. I dragged the Eaton's piano through the dust to our house, but when I got it there, I couldn't play. I had swollen lumps for hands. They dripped a sickly pus. They swung stupidly from my wrists. They stung with pain. When I woke up, the part about my hands was real. July 1934. A tent of pain. Daddy has made a tent out of the sheet over Ma, so nothing will touch her skin what skin she has left. I can't look at her. I can't recognize her. She smells like scorched meat, her body groaning there. It looks nothing like my ma. It doesn't even have a face. Daddy brings her water and drips it inside the slit of her mouth by squeezing a cloth. She can't open her eyes. She cries out when the baby moves inside her. Otherwise, she moans, day and night. I wish the dust would plug my ears so I couldn't hear her. July, 1934. Drinking. Daddy found the money Ma kept squirreled in the kitchen under the threshold. It wasn't very much, but it was enough for him to get good and drunk. He went out last night while Ma moaned and begged for water. He drank up the emergency money until it was gone. I tried to help her. I couldn't aim the dripping cloth into her mouth. I couldn't squeeze. It hurt the blisters on my hand to try. I only made it worse for Ma. She cried for the pain of the water running into her sores. She cried for the water that would not soothe her throat and quench her thirst, and the whole time, my father was in Guyman drinking. July 1934. Devoured. Doc sent me outside to get water. The day was so hot. The house was so hot. As I came out the door, I saw the cloud descending. 
It whirred like a thousand engines. It shifted shape as it came, settling first over Daddy's wheat. Grasshoppers, eating tassels, leaves, stalks. Then, coming closer to the house, eating Ma's garden, the fence posts, the laundry on the line. And then, the grasshoppers came right over me, descending on Ma's apple trees. I climbed into the trees, opening scabs on my tender hands, grasshoppers clinging to me. I tried beating them away, but the grasshoppers ate every leaf. They ate every piece of fruit. Nothing left but a couple apple cores hanging from Ma's trees. I couldn't tell her, couldn't bring myself to say her apples were gone. I never had a chance. Ma died that day giving birth to my brother, August 1934. Blame. My father's sister came to fetch my brother, even as Ma's body cooled. She came to bring my brother back to Lubbock to raise as her own, but my brother died before Aunt Ellis got here. She wouldn't even hold his little body. She barely noticed me. As soon as she found my brother dead, she had a talk with my father. Then she turned around and headed back to Lubbock. The neighbor women came. They wrapped my baby brother in a blanket and placed him in Ma's bandaged arms. We buried them together on the rise Ma loved, the one she gazed at from the kitchen window, the one that looks out over the dried up Beaver River. Reverend Bingham led the service. He talked about Ma, but what he said made no sense, and I could tell he didn't truly know her. He'd never even heard her play piano. He asked my father to name my baby brother. My father, hunched over, said nothing. I spoke up in my father's silence. I told the reverend my brother's name was Franklin, like our president. The women talked as they scrubbed death from our house. I stayed in my room, silent on the iron bed, listening to their voices. Billy Joe threw the pail, they said. An accident, they said. Under their words, a finger pointed. They didn't talk about my father leaving kerosene by the stove. They didn't say a word about my father drinking himself into a stupor while Ma writhed begging for water. They only said, Billy Joe threw the pail of kerosene. August 1934. Birthday. I walk to town. I don't look over my, I don't look back over my shoulder at the single grave holding Ma and my little brother. I am trying not to look back at anything. Dust rises with each step. There's a greasy smell to the air. On either side of the road are the carcasses of jackrabbits, small birds, field mice, stretching out into the distance. My father stares out across his land, empty but for a few withered stalks, like the tufts uh, on an old man's head. I don't know if he thinks more of Ma or the wheat that used to grow here. There's barely a blade of grass swaying in the stinging wind. There are only these lumps of flesh that once were hands long enough to span octaves, swinging at my sides. I come up quiet and sit behind Arley Wanderdale's house where no one can see me and lean my head back and close my eyes and listen to Arley play. August 1934 Roots. President Roosevelt tells us to plant trees. Trees will break the wind. He says, trees will end the drought. The animals can take shelter there. Children can take shelter. Trees have roots, he says. They hold on to the land. That's good advice, but I'm not sure he understands the problem. Trees have never been at home here. They are just not meant to be here. Maybe none of us are meant to be here. Only the prairie grass and the hawks.
My father will stay no matter what. He's stubborn as sod. And he and the land have a hold on each other. But what about me? August 1934. The Empty Spaces. I don't know my father anymore. He sits across from me. He looks like my father. He chews his food like my father. He brushes his dusty hair back like my father. But he is a stranger. I am awkward with him and irritated. And I want to be alone, but I am terrified of being alone. We are both changing. We are shifting to fill in the empty spaces left by Ma. I keep my raw and stinging hands behind my back when he comes near, because he stares when he sees them. September 1934 The hole. The heat from the cook stove hurts my burns and the salt, and the water, and the dust hurt too. And I spend all my time in pain, and my father spends his time out at the side of the house, digging a hole, 40 feet by 60 feet, six feet deep. I think he's digging the pond to feed off the windmill, the one, the one Ma wanted. But he doesn't say, he just digs. He sends me to the train yard to gather boards, boards that once were boxcars, but now are junk. I bring them back, careful of the scabs and the raw sores on my bare hands. I don't know what he needs boards for. He doesn't tell me. When he's not in the hole digging, he works on the windmill, replacing the parts that keep it from turning. People stop by and watch. They think my father is crazy digging such a big hole. I think he's crazy too. The water will seep back into the earth. It'll never stay put in any old pond. But my father has thought through all that and he's digging anyway. I think to talk to Ma about it and then I remember. I can almost forgive him the taking of Ma's money. I can almost forgive him his night in Gaiman, getting drunk. But as long as I live, no matter how big a hole he digs, I can't forgive him that pail of kerosene left by the side of the stove. September 1934. Kilauea. A volcano erupted in Ha Kilauea. It threw huge chunks into the air. The ground shook and smoke choked everything in its path. Sounds a little like a dust storm. September 1934. Boxes. In my closet are two boxes, the gatherings of my life. Papers, school drawings, a broken hairpin, a dress from my baby days, my first lock of hair, a tiny basket woven from prairie grass, a doll with a china head, a pink ball, Three dozen marbles, a fan from Baxter's funeral home, my baby teeth in a glass jar, a torn map of the world, two candy wrappers, a thousand things I haven't looked at in years. I kept promising to go through the boxes with Ma and get rid of what I didn't need, but I never got to it, and now my hands hurt, and I haven't got the heart. September 1934. Night Bloomer. Mrs. Brown's serious plant bloomed on Saturday night. She sent word after promising I could come see it. I rubbed my gritty eyes with swollen hands. My stomach grizzled as I made my way through the dark to her house. Ma wouldn't have let me go at all. My father just stood in the doorway and watched me leave. It was almost three in the morning when I got there. A small crowd stood around. Mrs. Brown said, The blossom opened at midnight, big as a dinner plate. It took only moments to unfold. How can such a flower find a way to bloom in this drought, in this wind? It blossomed at night, when the sun couldn't scorch it, when the wind was quiet, 
when there might have been a sip of dew to freshen it. I couldn't watch at dawn when the newer, touched by the first finger of morning light, wilted and died. I couldn't watch as their tender petals burned up in the sun. September 1934 The Path of Our Sorrow Miss Freeland said, During the Great War, we fed the world. We couldn't grow enough wheat to fill all the bellies. The price the world paid for our wheat was so high, it swelled our wallets and our heads, and we bought bigger tractors, more acres, until we had mortgages and rent and bills beyond reason. But we all felt so useful, we didn't notice. Then the war ended, and before long, Europe didn't need our wheat anymore. They could grow their own. But we needed Europe's money to pay our mortgage, our rent, our bills. We squeezed more cattle, more sheep, onto less land, and they grazed down the stubble till they reached root. And the price of wheat kept dropping, so we had to grow more bushels to make the same amount of money we made before to pay for all that equipment, all that land. And the more sod we plowed up, the drier things got, because the water that used to collect there, under the grass, biding its time, keeping things alive through the dry spells, wasn't there anymore. Without the sod, the water vanished. The soil turned to dust, until the wind took it lifting it up and carrying it away. Such a sorrow doesn't come suddenly. There are a thousand steps to take before you get there. But now, sorrow climbs up our front steps, big as Texas, and we didn't even see it coming, even though it had been making its way straight for us all along. September 1934